I'll uh, call this uh, hearing uh, to order this morning, and uh, the title of our hearing today is the American Energy Initiative. Uh, over the next uh, weeks and months, we intend to examine our domestic energy resources of all stripes that will diversify our energy portfolio, strengthen our national security, create jobs, and perhaps most importantly, make energy more affordable for all Americans. Of course, we talk about energy, we talk about energy to generate electricity, we talk about uh, energy for our automobiles, transportation, and today we're going to be focused a lot on that as well. We're going to focus specifically on the Gulf of Mexico's relation to energy production, energy security, oil prices, and jobs. Over the past several years, 30 percent of our total domestic oil production has come from the Gulf. Recent world events and market conditions have caused a sudden surge in oil prices. It is in this context that we must thoroughly evaluate this nation's current energy policy by asking uh, questions like, are we doing enough to capitalize on all of our domestic uh, resources? How can an increased domestic production influence prices and affect imports? What role does oil and gas production in the Gulf play in our economic recovery. New offshore exploration has taken a severe hit since the Deepwater Horizon blowout and spill. Without a doubt, the Deepwater Horizon spill was a serious environmental disaster. The human and ecological to tolls are still being absorbed. But out of the disaster created by Transocean and BP arrived an economic disaster in the form of a moratorium on deep water exploration issued by the Obama administration. Even since it was lifted in October, the Department of Interior has only issued two permits to drill in the deep water gulf. A federal district court judge called the administration's actions unreasonable and unjustified. And even, I noticed a few days ago, former President Clinton characterized it as ridiculous. Deepwater leases have become increasingly important to our domestic supply over the past two decades. Companies are not drilling there because, not be, excuse me. While production from shallower regions has steadily declined, ultra-deep production has grown at an annual rate of 15 percent since 2002. It is projected to continue this trajectory for the next several years. In fact, PFC Energy projects that by 2020, projects that by 2020, over 50 percent of the Gulf's production will come from ultra deep waters. This projection, however, was made prior to the administration's moratorium. So we intend to get into all of these issues today. We do know that as a result of the policy of this administration, we're getting 400,000 barrels a day of oil less than we uh, currently had projected. And as a result of that, we're importing more from places like Nigeria, Libya, Saudi Arabia, and Venezuela. So we really look forward to your testimony today. Uh, your testimony is very important. And as you know, at the end of your testimony, we'll be having questions for you. At this time, I would like to recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for the purpose of uh, introduction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate you holding this hearing. This is an issue that we've been very concerned about for a number of months. Uh, I really appreciate the panelists who have come here to talk about uh, the issue and especially what's happening on the ground because, you know, as we look kind of the big picture, Americans are fed up with paying high gas prices at the pump. Uh, but what's, what's going on behind the scenes, the actions that this president has taken to create this crisis uh, is even more devastating along the Gulf Coast. Uh, if you look at what's happening in the Gulf Coast where over a third of America's domestic energy is produced, uh, the president's policies are literally shutting this industry down. And, and I know we're going to be hearing testimony from people that represent a number of organizations uh, not the big guys that everybody talks about, but the small companies, those, those small businesses that are trying to hang on, that want to go back to work exploring safely for energy here in America, especially at a time when our country uh, is looking out at the Middle East at a time where they've never been more volatile, and yet the president's got a policy that's actually increasing our dependence on Middle Eastern oil. It's leading to higher gas prices. Uh, we've done a chart just to show 
how gas prices have skyrocketed since the president took the oath of office. $1.83 was the price of gas when President Obama was sworn in. Today it's over $3.50 and going higher. In fact, we had the energy secretary yesterday here before us. We asked him, what is the president's plan to lower gas prices? And he couldn't even tell us what that plan is. Now, I did see yesterday uh, that the, you can find out what the president's picks are for the Final Four. You can go to ESPN and watch the president making his Final Four picks, yet the Secretary of Energy, a cabinet post, can't even tell you what the president's plan is to lower gas prices. This is a crisis that's inexcusable at this administration is sitting by and forcing these industries to literally go bankrupt. And I know we're going to hear stories about that, and I appreciate the panelists, but we're fed up with this president's policies that are literally driving com companies, American companies, into bankruptcy. Over 12,000 jobs already lost. Gas prices skyrocketing, while the Middle East has never been more volatile. I appreciate the chairman for letting us address this issue, and I look forward to your testimony. I yield back. Thank you. Um, I recognize the gentleman from uh, Illinois for his opening statement, Mr. Rush. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have to say that was a pretty strange uh, and unique introduction <laughs> that we just heard. <laughs> so, uh, but I want to thank you, uh, and also I want to thank the panelists for being here uh, this morning uh, with, uh, with, with this committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, today's hearing is titled the American Energy Initiative, but uh, ironically, earlier this week, uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle voted to handcuff one of the agencies that has helped move America forward by promoting energy conservation and making our vehicles, appliances, buildings, and power plants more energy efficient. Over the past four decades, the EPA has been at the forefront of promoting better gas mileage for cars and trucks and saving American families of millions of dollars at the pump while also making us less dependent on foreign oil. However, uh, instead of offering any real solution or plans that would even remotely resemble an energy initiative, the ups and in inhoff bill that my Republican colleagues just passed through this uh, committee will actually increase our reliance on fossil fuels, both imported and domestic, which is great for the oil companies, but not so great for American families. I'm actually not opposed to the domestic oil production, including drilling in the Gulf, as long as I am convinced that the devastating oil spill that we witnessed last year with BP's Makanda uh, well cannot and will not be repeated. I'm in favor of uh, domestic oil production uh, and, and drilling in the Gulf. While I understand that there are no guarantees in this business, I know that the risks that BB took can and should be mitigated. Therefore, I believe that the course of action that President Obama's administration took after the BP oil spill was prudent and was necessary. As after witnessing the explosion that claimed 11 lives and watching over four, four million barrels of oil gushing to the uh, Gulf for months without end, I believe it was reasonable and wise to halt drilling until we better understood what happened, why it happened, and how we can better prepare uh, ourselves so that it will never ever happen again. And when the, pre when, when the president uh, lifted the moratorium last uh, October, I also agree with the Secretary of Interior's assessment that drilling could resume, and I quote, uh, provided that operators certify compliance with all existing rules and requirements and demonstrate the availability of adequate blowout containment resources. For me and for my constituents, the anguish and the grief of helplessly watching oil gushing to the Gulf for months on end while BP, the federal government, and every un other ent entity remain powerless to stop it has not faded from memory. Yet I also understand that just as thousands of jobs and livelihoods were impacted and continues to be impacted by the oil spill last year, there are also repercussions on jobs and our nation's energy supply 
by not allowing drilling to continue in the Gulf. So today my hope is to gain an even better understanding of where we are now nearly a year later from the initial explosion and spill and to find out what improvements have been made in regards to safeguarding against the same type of event uh, from ever happening again. I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses on how their lives and their livelihoods have been impacted and their thoughts on how we sh uh, can move forward. But Mr. Chairman, uh, as, as I conclude, I just want to say that I do empathize with the people of the Gulf. I empathize with uh, their fine um, uh, representative here in, 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 in Congress, Mr. Mr. Scalise. Uh, uh, and I look forward to seeing uh, a day soon where the drills will be pumping and uh, uh, the, sea, the fish uh, and the seafood will be uh, productive uh, and on our, on our plates and on our tables and in our foods uh, all across this country. And I look forward to the time when the Gulf is thriving once again. Thank you very much, and I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, Mr. Rush, thank you very much. And um, once again, I want to welcome the panel. We have a distinguished group with us this morning. Uh, we have Mr. Marty Massey, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Marine Well Containment Company. We have Mr. Jim No, who's the Executive Director of the Shallow Water Energy Security Coalition. We have Mr. Rip Daniels, who is CEO and manager of a WJZD and also vice president of the Mississippi Gulf Coast uh, Tourism Commission. We have Mr. Jim Adams, who's president of the Offshore Marine Services Association. We have Dr. Mark Cooper, who's a research director for the Consumer Federation of America. We have Dr. Joseph Mason, who is a professor at the business school at Louisiana State University. And then we have Mr. Lou Puglarisi, who is the president of the Energy Policy Research Foundation. So I will recognize you and give the five minute opening statement and then after the entire panel has completed, uh, we'll go into a question and answer period. So thank you again for being here. And Mr. Massey, I'll, you wanna go ahead and see? Sorry, I've been instructed that we want to give Mr. Puglarisi the first opportunity to speak. So we'll recognize you for five minutes and we'll go that way. Thank you. And, and be sure and turn the microphone on, sir. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Chairman uh, Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, and members of the Subcommittee on Energy and Power, on behalf of myself and Eprink, uh, we welcome this opportunity to testify today. Uh, we think it's very important we uh, move quickly to uh, expand American employment, grow the economy, and deliver adequate supplies of gasoline at affordable prices. Now, the Energy Policy Research Foundation is a not-for-profit organization that studies energy economics with special emphasis on petroleum and the downstream product markets. We've been doing this since 1944. Uh, our reports are, are made available free of charge to all interested organizations and individuals. We've recently uh, done some uh, work on Iraq's potential to expand world oil supplies, the Macondo oil spill, the role of ethanol in the American gasoline market, Keystone XL pipeline, and the value of Canadian oil sands to the United States. But, but today I, I, I want to focus on two considerations that I, that I hope the committee will give careful thought to as we look at how we expand domestic oil and gas development. First is that Prices of transportation fuels today, they don't reflect just what is happening in the physical market now, but more importantly, what buyers and sellers believe about future supply. And expectations about the future can affect prices today, and this includes expectations on government policies. The next issue that I think the committee really needs to put a lot of effort into is that government policies related to oil and gas, as including transportation fuels, that do not hold up well under uncertainty are likely to fail and impose very high costs on the American economy, its consumers, and our energy security. <clears throat> We're often told that every time we face a period of rising gasoline prices, that common sense measures such as expanding access to the Canadian oil sands, opening up drilling in the onshore Alaska, permitting drilling in Arctic waters, expanding oil and gas leasing to new provinces in the lower 48, and deep water drilling in the Gulf of Mexico will bring supplies into the market too far into the future to help us with the current crisis. 
or that the supplies will be too small to make a difference. Putting aside that we say this every time we have a crisis, if we open up our resources for development, we can open up the opportunity to shift long-term expectations on domestic supply and receive the benefits of lower prices even before the prices come to market. We may even get some pleasant surprises, such as we recently experienced with the shale gas revolution. The application of new technology and techniques in horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing learned in producing natural gas is now supporting rising onshore crude oil production in the Bakken Formation in North Dakota. Now, major and sustained shifts in the price of crude oil since the 1970s can be explained by changes in expectations about future output. For example, in the 1973 Arab oil embargo, we really didn't lose that much oil in the prompt period. But expectations about the growth of production from the Persian Gulf came way down, and prices moved up quickly in the current period. In 1979, during the Iranian Revolution, once again, the amount of oil lost during the Iranian Revolution and the Iran-Iraq War was relatively small. But expectations about future growth of production from Iraq and Iran drove up prices in the prompt period. And the reason we say this, we, you know, and I'd like to submit for the record an article we published on this very topic in the Oil and Gas Journal, and with your permission, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. Uh, so th this leads us to the question of why is a highly aggressive program for domestic oil and gas development so important? You know, what, what do we get out of that? And I think there's, and I think one of the things we can do is go back, look, look back just five years. What do we believe? We believe first that we were running short on natural gas. Many people testified before this committee that the U.S. was going to be a massive importer of LNG and that uh, we, we would have very little gas for the utility sector. But the shale gas revolution proved that to be completely wrong. We should be grateful for the independent oil and gas drillers who don't read the EIA forecasts and have little confidence that the government knows exactly how much oil and gas we have in, in, in our resource base. And in fact, the shale gas revolution itself, in one year, has probably saved American consumers $50 billion. We also had a, a, co a common view was that Latin America was fully explored. But we now see that uh, uh, with the deep, uh, dis deep water discoveries in Brazil, that that is no longer the case. We don't know how much oil we're going to have out of Latin America, but it's going to be huge. Uh, an another concern we have is... Uh, we have this view that the long-run price is, of oil is going to be very high, say $200 a barrel. And I think we would argue that that's, that's going to turn out to be incorrect, that if we do the right kinds of things, the long-run price of oil is likely to be considerably lower, and that a lot of the programs we're engaging into are going to turn out to be quite costly. We can transition to the fuels of the future at a much lower cost. Um, I, I, just, uh, I just want to leave you with this one final point here. If we can alter the long-term price of crude oil by nearly $20 a barrel in our base case forecast, $100 versus 80 or 60 in, in, instead of 80, I mean you know, 80 instead of 100 or 60 instead of 80, the present value savings to the import bill alone is a trillion dollars. The savings to the economy is more than twice that much. And, and so in the end, this means that the jobs, return on capital, corporate and personal income taxes, government revenues from bonus bids and royalties would grow substantially. All of this can take place without taking on any government debt, would deliver sustainable economic growth, and we can put thousands of people to work tomorrow. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Mason, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this very important topic today. Unfortunately, little has changed in the Gulf region since my initial study on the economic cost of the Gulf moratorium in July 2010. Economic activity is still moribund in the region, and the outlook for exploration and development remains subdued. Each day, more exploration and development activity in the Gulf is lost. Job losses previously estimated on the basis of a six-month moratorium have increased from 8,000 regionally and 12,000 nationally to 13,000 regionally and 19,000 nationally. Lost wages of 500 million regionally and 700 million nationally are now 800 million regionally and 1.1 billion nationally. Lost tax revenues estimated to be 100 million on the state and local level and 200 million on the national level now amount to 155 million and 350 million respectively. 
The Fed's August 2010 Beige Book noted that factories, farms, and mines nationally were all seeing, quote, continued gains in demand and sales, unquote, while housing sales and the related construction industry slowed. But in the Atlanta district, quote, fewer manufacturers noted increases in new orders, and more said that orders were lower, unquote. In the Dallas district, the Fed reported directly, quote, the deep water drilling moratorium was expected to impact revenues, unquote. Still, economic deniers seem to be unable to accept the fact that restrictive economic policies targeted to our most productive economic sectors weaken economic growth. That growth won't be recovered either. The lost development and drilling progress in the Mora and Permatorium have already created a lag in production. The concept can be thought of simply in the context of shutting down a construction project or a production line. When you start it back up, you don't make up for lost progress, you just continue where you left off. Moreover, if you constrain the production line to work slower than before and don't replace the machinery when it wears out, production will decline further, perhaps to a much lower rate. That's already happening in the Gulf, and recent recovery projections illustrate that dynamic. But even those projections don't contain the effects of additional restrictive policies. President Obama's FY 2012 comprehensive budget proposal includes an estimated $37 billion of punitive tax policies for U.S. oil and gas firms. Repealing tax breaks for hiring domestic workers when unemployment is hovering at 10 percent just doesn't make sense and double taxing foreign revenues of domestic oil and gas firms puts them at a severe disadvantage competing against state-run heavily subsidized oil and gas companies in such countries as China, Russia, and Venezuela. Which brings us to the international perspective. None of the decline in Gulf production arising from restrictive U.S. policies means that worldwide production will be affected. As projects in the Gulf and elsewhere in the U.S. are abandoned, firms will rationally move to locations with more stable and predictable business climates, whether or not those are held together by authoritarian regimes or are environmentally favorable. All the production possibilities discussed previously are being foregone in the name of Deepwater Horizon. But while debate still rages about the causal factor of the disaster, one common thread is accepted by all, BP. Nonetheless, the first Deepwater permit issued to the Santiago well on March 11th went to a project 46.5% owned by BP. It seems to me, therefore, that BP is the one firm undeniably culpable, but BP was the first to be rewarded with continued drilling access. That doesn't make sense. Economically, it has to be realized that any regulatory policy that raises pecuniary and or non-pecuniary production costs will slow economic output. Whether the industry is mortgage banks facing onerous terms of a state attorney's general consumer financial protection bureau settlement, or the oil and gas industry facing increased environmental compliance costs in a permatorium, in both cases that means less jobs, lower wages, and lower GDP growth than would otherwise occur. Those are immutable laws of economics. Last, I would be remiss if I did not point out that the Japanese, following a devastating earthquake, are experiencing problems in non-fossil fuel power plants. While fossil fuels have their faults, other alternatives are only cleaner in terms of carbon output. Each, however, still pollutes in its own way, and as new energy sectors develop, each is leaving new economic externalities, that is, unpriced byproducts of production and use, that promise to devastate the environment in amounts equal to or greater than carbon-based fossil fuels. There is no environmental economic free lunch. There is no clean energy, just energy. A sound policy focus would be to use all of it wisely. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Mason. Uh, Dr. Cooper, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Since the Arab oil embargo of 1973, it has been clear that the United States must reduce its consumption of oil. Seven presidents have talked about this urgent need, and even President Bush, an oil man from Texas, declared that we must end our oil addiction. In the past, we have failed to do so. Yet today, the United States has a better opportunity than ever to change the trajectory of the American oil consumption, lower consumer expenditures, reduce our dependence on Mideast oil, and enhance national security by dramatically increasing the fuel economy of the vehicle fleet. The need is urgent as gasoline prices are pummeling household budgets, especially of the middle class. Public support for a 60 mile per gallon standard is at an all time high. The economics of putting fuel savings technology into automobiles and light trucks 
have never been more favorable. And because of the foresight of Congress over a dozen states and the Obama administration, policymakers have a better set of tools to respond to the challenge than ever. The most important thing that we can do for consumers in the short term is to make a long-term commitment to reduce American oil consumption. Efficiency is the least cost, most certain, cleanest energy resource we have for our American energy initiative. Quick fixes simply delay the day of reckoning and make it more painful when it comes. U.S. gasoline prices this year will hit an all-time high if the EIA is correct, as will household expenditures. For low- and middle-income households, the cost of gasoline will be the single most important determinant of the cost of driving, exceeding uh, ownership costs. Driven by high and volatile prices, we find that concern about gasoline is at an all-time high. Ninety percent of the respondents to a recent survey said they were concerned about price. Eighty-nine percent said they were concerned about Mideast imports. This high level of concern translates into high support for fuel economy standards. We asked about 60 miles per gallon. Sixty-three percent said they support that as a target for 2025. Seventy percent of middle class respondents did. Now, as a consumer group, we always start our economic analysis from the consumer pocketbook. And we find that the public support for a 60 mile per gallon standard is, in fact, justified by the economics. Our analysis shows that from the first month, the reduction in gasoline costs exceed any increase in the cost of the new technology in vehicles. It's cash flow positive in the first month of a five-year auto loan. And at the end of the auto loan, the consumer has over approximately $2,000 more in, in their pocketbook. Our confidence that consumers will realize these benefits and that a 60 mile per gallon standard will be uh, met and effective is reinforced by the increase in technologies and choices available in the marketplace. There are now or will soon be four different approaches to electric vehicles, hybrids, plug-ins, hybrid plug-ins, and extended range electric vehicles, offered across the full range of cars that consumers in America like, compacts, mid-sized family sedans, large cars, SUVs, and pickups, by over a half a dozen mass market-oriented companies. Gasoline-powered vehicles already rival the mileage of some of the hybrids, and there's lots of room for improvement with greater uh, technologies in engine co combustion efficiency, transmission systems, vehicle body design, rolling resistance, and materials. But the trump card here is the fact that over the last five years, we have put in place in America the possibility for a pro-consumer, pro-competitive, technology-neutral fuel economy standards program. We've, ad we've adopted an attributes based system, which ensures that Americans will have the choice of cars they want, and automakers will have the incentive to compete to sell those precise types of cars. Fifteen states have adopted the Clean Cars Program. One-third of the people in this country live in those states, which stimulated e development of electrics and pushed the feds to a higher level. And the Obama administration has, in fact, transformed the institutional structure of standard setting in America, coordinating between the federal and the state level, showing that a 62 mile per gallon standard is technically feasible and economically practicable, and proposing a 15 year target. The long term view allows the auto industry and the public to adjust. It reduces the marketplace risk of higher standards. It reorients thinking and gives them time to retool. retool. This is the moment to change the trajectory of American gasoline consumption, to put efficiency as the first step and the heart of the American Energy Initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. Uh, Mr. Adams, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm Jim Adams, and I represent the Offshore Marine Service Association, OMSA. OMSA speaks for 250 companies, including 100 firms, that own and operate marine vessels in the Gulf of Mexico. Our vessels connect America with its offshore resources, transporting every employee, every pipe, every wrench, every computer, barrel of fuel, uh, 
every gallon of drinking water off to the offshore rigs and platforms. After the Macondo tragedy in April of last year, Secretary Salazar infamously, infamously proclaimed that he would keep his boot on the neck of BP. We quickly learned that his intention was to keep his boot on the neck of every business owner and worker engaged in the offshore oil and gas industry. With the full support of the White House, he has ruthlessly shut down our industry. Drilling rigs sit idle, offshore supply vessels are moored at the dock, and layoffs mount. <laughs> President Obama and Secretary Salazar say they support domestic oil and gas development in this country. However, for the past 11 months, the administration's moratorium has eliminated jobs and continues to export them to foreign countries. Some have suggested that this is a partisan issue, but Democrats and Republicans alike for, uh, have called for an immediate end to the uh, mistreatment of our industry. Former President Bill Clinton, Secretary Mary Landrieu, excuse me, Senator Mary Landrieu, Senator Mark Begich, Congressman Gene Green of this committee, and others have called for the administration to stand down. Before the Macondo incident, my members operated 1,200 vessels that serviced 33 deep water rigs and 50 shallow water rigs and almost 4,000 fixed platforms in operation in the Gulf of Mexico. Our vessels collectively provided $44.6 billion annually in wages and represent an investment in offshore uh, companies of over $18 billion in vessels and equipment. Our vessels and shipyards that build and repair our vessels had direct employment of over, over 30,000 em employees. Additionally, over 100,000 jobs are supported by the economic t activities by our U.S. shipyards and offshore supply vessel operators. The federal government collected nearly $1.4 billion in taxes directly and indirectly in 2008 due to the operations of this segment of the oil and gas industry. Like any market, the number of employees and vessels engaged in the offshore service industry will expand and contract based upon customer demand. In this case, the Interior Department dictated that our customers' activity in deep water exploration would shrink from 33 rigs to none for 10 months and counting. In the shallow water sector, the administration reduced normal exploration activities by well over two-thirds from previous years. As a result, we are seeing industry-wide vessel utilization rates below 50 percent of the fleet's capacity, and employment reductions are over 25 percent, and they will rise very quickly. Business owners who are struggling to make payroll to retain highly skilled employees for as long as possible will be forced into making more layoffs in the coming months. Without exploration permits, as the demand driver in our, in our market, we will see further contraction. This uh, resulting shameful decline in the American offshore industry and the permanent loss of world class, a world-class workforce will be a loss to this country's economy. The de facto moratorium is responsible for exporting some of our most strategically valuable um, and technologically capable U.S. flag vessels and the U.S. jobs that go with them to foreign markets. To date, approximately 60 of these highest class vessels with a value of over $1.5 billion that employed over 1,100 Americans uh, have left the Gulf of Mexico for foreign markets. On these highly technical vessels, crew members enjoyed the highest compensation levels in our industry with an average wage, an average wage of over $75,000 per crew member. Our skilled workforce is critical to the safe reactivation of deep water drilling in the Gulf, and yet we are in jeopardy of losing those assets and the careers that go with them. It is time for the blockade to end. President Obama's moratorium needs to end because it is killing jobs. It is raising the price of energy, and it is making our country more vulnerable to an unpredictable international political situation. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'll be pleased to answer questions from you or any of the members of the subcommittee 
and we desperately ask for your help to get us back to work. Thank you very much, Mr. Adams. And Mr. Daniels, you're recognized for five minutes. Yes, uh, uh, Chairman <coughs> Whitfield and uh, Ranking Member Rush, and subcommittee members, appreciate it. I I'm a capitalist. I've been in business on the Mississippi Gulf Coast since Jimmy Carter was president. That's taken some doing, too, tr trust me. <coughs> but I must tell you, upon uh, being so, it is more than obvious to me that it seems as though since April 20th we've forgotten the number of jobs that the coast and Mississippi produced as a result of tourism. Close to a million. And just from a backyard businessman's point of view, trading a, a multi-billion dollar tourism and seafood industry for a multi-million dollar whale is not good business. It's not a matter of uh, the fact that we shouldn't have deep water drilling, I think it's, it's, it's appropriate. What we're discussing here is how can it do so without jeopardizing the businesses, small businesses along the coastline. I think that's doable. First and foremost, there must be some ecological impact. The, I'm sorry, the ecological impact studies should be based upon not only marine life, but the adverse effect it would have on small businesses along the coast if there is a spill. Seems as though we've had some kind of uh, selective amnesia as to what transpired and what resulted and why it was so important that President Barack Obama imposed the moratorium. Let me tell you why, what happened. The explosion happened April 20th. The 25th, there were robots to have a blowout. It didn't work. May 2nd, uh, started the drilling relief valves. May 7th, um, I'm sorry, May 7th, uh, it, there was an attempt to put on a hat, a 100-ton 100, 100 hat. Didn't work. And on and on, then they inserted the tube around May 14th. Top kill started to, on the 26th, didn't work. And June the 4th, there was an attempt to cap the valves. June 25th, there was Hurricane Alex. As I sat watching what's happening in, in Japan, it is too also about energy, but it's about something else. It's about the mere fact that we don't do business in a vacuum, and sometimes Mother Nature doesn't cooperate. From the time April 20th started with the explosion, there were some five tropical storms and three hurricanes. We on the Gulf Coast were cheering the fact that there was no more drilling, or, 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 or exploratory drilling, especially no leaks, because there was no guarantee there was a way to stop it. It made good sense to have a moratorium at that time, and, and it made good sense now. The reality is, is this. I think that there should be deep water drilling, without a doubt. However, the first, the first responsibility for us in business is not to do business at the peril of those citizens who are our customers. I'm a customer. I'm not an experiment. Right now, as we speak, over the last three months, there have been over 60 dolphins washed up. Half of them, half of them were calves, stillborn. Right now, they're being explored. Noah called this an unusual mortality event. Uh, Moby Salangi, who was the director of the Institute of Marine uh, uh, Mammal Studies there in Gulfport, said this, and I quote, when we see something strange like this happen to large groups of dolphin, we are, uh, which are at the top of the food chain, it tells us the rest of the food chain is affected. Now, trust me on this. I'm going to eat my seafood. I eat it every day. I'm going to do it primarily because it is going to be my specimen that's going to determine whether or not there was an effect. I don't recommend it for pregnant women, and I don't recommend it for my children right now. Keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, there's a reason for why at the top of the list of the inalienable rights was life. Because without life, there would be no reason for liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And what we're talking about right here is whether or not on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, there will be. There are still tall balls uh, washing up. I went deep sea fishing, caught black tip shark and about 75 Spanish mackerel. What was strange about that was that there were men on, with hazmat suits on Ship Island, the Federal Island. Now, that was a little bit odd. We still get tar balls washing up. And all of us, all of us on the coast are a little bit apprehensive as to whether or not there will be another storm and our beaches will be black. This is new science. But at the very least, the industry, the, be it my industry or the oil industry, has to take in, take, make priorities as it applies to life. That has to come first in our quest to pursue happiness. Because without life, there's no reason for the other two inalienable rights. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Daniels. And uh, Mr. Noe, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. As Executive Director of the Shallow Water Energy Security Coalition and Senior Vice President, General Counsel, and Chief Compliance Officer of Hercules Offshore, I very much appreciate the opportunity to address the devastating economic impact of the Obama Administration's reckless oil and gas policies. Mr. Chairman, the economic impact of the Obama Administration's offshore oil and gas policies are direct, severe, and long-lasting. Over 400,000 jobs across the Gulf Coast alone are tied to the offshore energy business. Each one of our shallow water rigs is a floating factory. These floating factories employ 500 highly skilled and well-paid Americans, from the workers on the rig floor to the welders, dock workers, supply boat captains, helicopter pilots, and equipment manufacturers, and scores of others that support our industry. These jobs are at risk, and for one simple reason. The Obama administration is shutting down these floating factories rig by rig. As, at, at a time when this nation's economy is struggling to recover from one of the deepest recessions in our lifetime, and unemployment, unemployment rates remain high, the, this administration is irresponsibly putting policies in place that are destroying thousands of good paying jobs. Mr. Chairman, this is no abstraction for me. The extreme policies of the administration have claimed one of our coalition members, and I fear others might follow. Just a few weeks ago, the country's second largest shallow water drilling company, Seahawk Drilling, declared bankruptcy, eliminating 1,000 good paying jobs. I personally know the pain that this caused because I was there. It was late in the day on Friday, February 11th, when I arrived at Seahawks offices. As I was led into a conference room, pensive employees got up from their desks, went uh, to their doors, and eyed me. I had the opportunity to look into the eyes and see the apprehension on their faces. Once inside the conference room, I executed the necessary documents for Hercules to buy Seahawks 20 rig. As I left, I put my hand on a Seahawk executive shoulder and saw in his eyes that he was fighting back the emotions of the day. He paused, took a deep breath, and walked out of the conference room to inform the large gathering of Seahawk employees that the company was bankrupt. The bankruptcy of Seahawk was avoidable. Seahawk had nothing to do with the Macondo blowout, but it was destroyed by the misguided and heartless policies of this administration. Members of this committee have joined with others in a bar bipartisan effort to implore the administration to change course. Even, President, uh, even former President Clinton recently said that the administration's offshore drilling policies were ridiculous. And yet, the administration persists in an ideologically driven mission to raise energy prices and to eliminate offshore oil and gas production and the many thousands of jobs that depend on it. Mr. Chairman, immediately after the Macondo blowout last April, shallow water drilling operations were halted for 30 days by the moratorium issued by Secretary Salazar. Yet, after the moratorium was supposedly lifted, Interior refused to promptly and regularly issue shallow water drilling permits. Only 37 shallow water permits have been approved in the 11 months since the disaster, when the normal historical rate has been 10 to 15 or even more per month. That constitutes an 85 percent reduction in the rate of monthly permit actions. The Obama administration's policies are now coming home to roost. The ongoing turmoil in North Africa and the Middle East and the decreasing domestic oil and gas production have combined to cause dramatic spikes in the price of oil and gasoline. At gas stations across America, our fellow Americans are feeling the impact of the administration's policies. Mr. Chairman, the facts are clear. Despite the, the repeated statements by the Obama administration to the contrary, rigs are leaving the Gulf of Mexico and production is declining. Since May 2010, at least 12 offshore rigs have departed the Gulf of Mexico, seven deep water and five jackup rigs, with at least four additional rigs currently under active consideration for departure. Once the equipment leaves the Gulf, it, it will be years, if ever, before the rig and the other vital equipment and skilled crew become available again for use in the Gulf of Mexico. Production in the Gulf of Mexico has already declined. The federal government's own Energy Information Administration confirmed that the production in the Gulf declined by nearly 300,000 barrels per day since April 2010, and that domestic oil, oil production will fall a full 13 percent in each of 2011 and 2012. This represents a loss of production of about 450 million barrels per day. That's $45 billion worth of oil that we will have to find somewhere else. Mr. Chairman, 
we simply must reverse course as a nation we need to reverse the decline quickly in order to reclaim control of our economic destiny and protect our national security thank you and for your committee for the recognition that the gulf of mexico and oil and gas supplies are critical to our national and economic security and your willingness to use all options at your disposal to compel this administration to reverse its dangerous energy policy thank you mr no mr massey recognized for five minutes Chairman Whit uh, Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, uh, members of the committee, it, it is a privilege to join you today. Let me begin by uh, introducing myself. Uh, for three decades, I've served in the oil and gas industry uh, for ExxonMobil Corporation, uh, during which time operating safely has been a top concern of mine, as it has been for my colleagues. I was born and raised in Louisiana. I graduated from LSU with a degree in, in petroleum engineering and my first job for the company was as a drilling engineer in the Gulf of Mexico. I am currently seconded from ExxonMobil to the Marine Well Containment Company as its chief executive officer. I am grateful for the opportunity to discuss the new Marine Well Containment System that our members have developed to safeguard the Gulf of Mexico. In the event of a deep water well control incident, I am glad to report that the interim system is, was completed last month and it's now available for deployment if it is required. First, let me briefly summarize the evolution of this system. The global energy industry has successfully drilled more than 14,000 deep water wells. But after the tragic chain of events from the Macondo blowout, it was clear that the industry could improve our preparedness to respond if an operator lost control and subsequent containment of, of a well. So on July 21st, four of the largest en energy companies operating in the Gulf of Mexico, ExxonMobil, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, and Shell, announced that they would design and build a containment system for the Gulf. They would form an independent, not-for-profit organization that would own, operate, and maintain the system. BP recently joined us and helped to establish the interim containment system. And I'm pleased to say that Apache has now joined us as well. Just before coming to Washington yesterday, Anadarko became the next member of, of our company. These companies have done what they set out to do. The interim system is, is ready to go. The Gulf of Mexico is now safeguarded by being able to respond in the event an operator loses complete control and then subsequent containment of a well. One of the system's most critical components is its capping stack. That's a piece of equipment that can shut in the oil flow or if necessary, we can divert the oil flow up to vessels that are on the water surface. This capping stack can handle up to 15,000 pounds per square inch, more than the pressure of the Macondo well. Today, the interim system that we have in place has processing and storage capacity of 60,000 barrels a day and can operate in 8,000 feet. That's 3,000 feet deeper than Macondo. We're not stopping there. These capacities will be further expanded next year. With these additional capacities, we will be able to handle up to 100,000 barrels a day and operate in 10,000 feet of water. In short, this system significantly improves upon previous Gulf of Mexico response capabilities. We now have ready access to the equipment and the resources that we need to cap or contain a well. A few weeks ago, we had the opportunity to demonstrate to Secretary Salazar and Director Bromwich the system's capabilities. The marine well containment system, the interim system, has been accepted for use in permit applications. As a result, our members have submitted new applications that will rely on this system if it's required. We are hopeful that this will now facilitate the approval of deep water drilling permits. The energy resources of the Gulf are critically important. They account for 30% of the U.S. oil and gas production and support more than 170,000 American jobs. As industry and governments work together to develop these resources, it's critical that we do so responsibly. 
In creating this new system, the Marine Rail Containment Company worked closely with the Department of in Interior and with the Coast Guard, who, as you know, will, be res will control and lead the response to any offshore incidents. We have great confidence in this system. It is ready. The Marine Well Containment System meets the requirements of the regulation on containment. Thus, it enables the men and women of the energy industry to get back to work to the Gulf of Mexico to produce our nation's offshore energy resources. Thank you for your attention. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Massey. And uh, um, I'll recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. On this new containment system that has been developed by these four major companies, plus Apache, plus, Ar is it Arco? And at Arco now. And Arco. Uh, you, you demonstrated this uh, to Mr. Salazar and Mr. Bromwich, is that correct? And their staff. Correct. And uh, have, when do you ex expect new permits would be issued, uh, the application of which depends upon this containment system? Do you have any idea? Yes, uh, you know, as I mentioned, Secretary Salazar and Director Bromwich uh, came. They actually uh, visited the site where we have this capping stack, which is a critical piece of the equipment. Uh, and we had an opportunity to discuss the uh, system capabilities. Uh, after that meeting, uh, we were given the word that, yes, our system is accepted. And you can now use our system in your permit applications. So that was good news. And now we have members of our company that have actually submitted per permit applications that rely on our system. So they're actually in front of the BOEMRE uh, ready for approval now. And I'm hopeful that, you know, we're just a matter of days, we're going to get approval of some of those permits. Well, that's uh, encouraging because I guess we've only had two permits issued and they were both for producing uh, wells already. So uh, that's encouraging. Uh, Mr. Pugliariso, I wanted to ask you, you, in your testimony, you talked about anticipation and its impact on prices. Normally, we think about just supply and demand on pricing, and would you elaborate just a little bit about how anticipation af affects these oil prices or gasoline prices? You want to hit your microphone. The, the best case we have is actually in, in natural gas. We we had a period of time with very high natural gas prices. And as the shale gas revolution began to move, the, uh, even though uh, there were periods of times when the, when the prompt period, the natural gas and the prompt period wasn't growing that fast, the price began to decline rather ra rapidly because buyers and sellers are looking out and they're saying, this is real. This is going to happen over time. There's a good chance the government won't be able to stop this. Uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting if you, uh, and, and I, I think you know, one of the messages we want to leave you with is that you don't want to foreclose really positive outcomes. And if, if we sort of fix ourselves on this view that we know how much oil and gas is out there, we know what's going to happen in the future, and, by, and so we don't need to do X or Y, that's usually a mistake. We need to open the system up as much as possible so we can get as much different approaches to <coughs> developing these oil and gas resources. Do any of you have any thoughts of <clears throat> whether or not gasoline would reach $5 a gallon by the summer? Okay, that would be a guess. Okay, we won't. <laughs> we won't go, go. Yeah, Dr. Cooper, what do you, what do you say? Well, um, I, I stay away from predicting gasoline prices in part because um, okay. gasoline markets <coughs> are afflicted by two <coughs> sets of factors that have nothing to do with economics. Okay, well, you can't answer my question, so thank you. Well, <laughs> I appreciate it. It's a risky business predicting yeah. $5 a, a gallon. Yeah. Mr. Massey, you had indicated that in this business of, of drilling in the Gulf, there are about 170,000 employees. And is, is that correct? Yes. Uh, we, we've, uh, from third-party sources and so yeah. forth, they, they've tallied up the number of jobs. And when I say I'm talking about direct jobs. Yeah, not, dir not direct, but not indirect. And, and how many jobs were lost during this period over the last eight or nine months? Does anyone have any idea total in the industry? In the, in the tourism industry or the oil industry? 
Well, I'm going to get to the tourism in just a minute. I was trying to get the oil first, and then I'd like to get the tourism. And you, d y yes, Dr. Mason. Uh, I'll address the question generally and, and briefly, uh, but that is a, a very tricky question because of this problem that uh, good business owners will try to keep their best employees around, but right. they've done that out of their own pocket. And uh, when you try to count actual job losses, the number can be skewed in a way that can create misleading results. Okay. We know that Seahawk went bankrupt, though, and they had 1,000 employees, correct? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, that's correct. Yeah, you know, I think we, it, it's frustrating that, uh, that the administration is using the fact that many companies, like Hercules, has acted as a good corporate citizen and kept employees on the payroll despite the fact that we don't have jobs for them to do. And as you mentioned, uh, the bankruptcy of Seahawk drilling, they have a, at, at, their, at their height about 1,000 jobs. Hercules, once, once we close the transaction, we'll try to hire everybody we can. We can't hire everybody. We've even agreed to pay for all the employees who are laid off their, their health care benefits, uh, even if we never hire them. So there are real jobs that have been lost, but I think, the, as Dr. Mason suggested, many companies are, have been treading water and have been waiting and waiting for the administration to uh, act on their rhetoric, uh, and they tell us that there's no moratorium, but we don't get permits. So it, it's, it's like running an airline business. If you get a, uh, a permit to fly from New York to Los Angeles uh, and you don't know if you're going to get a permit to fly back, do you lay the, when, you fl when you reach Los Angeles, do you lay the crew off? Do you mothball the airplane? <coughs> and those are the decisions that we've been uh, faced as an industry. And because we've been acting as good corporate citizen, we've decided to keep okay. our workers uh, on the okay. payroll. But at Mr. some point, <coughs> it has to stop. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Noe. Um, yes, ahead. sir. Mr. Chairman, uh, in the vessel sector, what we saw was deferred pain. Our vessels were um, intensely engaged in the response and cleanup uh, operations through the late fall of last year. That meant that crews stayed busy on <coughs> day rate jobs. Those contracts ended, and there is no work to fill. Okay. And so that, that's why we, we would suggest that the, 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 the best efforts have been made to, to retain crews, but the ability to, to manage cash flow will have an end <coughs> very shortly. Okay. Now, my time's expired, but Mr. Daniel, I will, if you have a number on the tourism side, I'd be happy to hear it. Uh, yes, I, I do. Um, all of the fishing fleet, all of the shrimping fleet in Gulfport, all of those men lost their jobs. All of the fleet in, in Chalmette, Louisiana, and along the Louisiana line, all those men lost their jobs. Okay. Thanks to BP coming in and hiring them, it, it helped out a lot. But they all, every, okay. every fisherman on the coast, lost his job. Okay, thank you. At this time, I recognize Mr. Rush for five minutes. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I thank you so much. Uh, we heard a lot today uh, about the impact of the oil spill and the aftermath of the, of the spill on the gas and the oil uh, industry. And uh, I think you, it should be well noted that Mr. Daniels uh, uh, is here and he can speak to the economic costs of the oil spill to other industries on the Gulf Coast, including the tourism industry. Uh, and uh, I want to note that Mr. Daniels appeared before the DNC uh, subcommittee in July of last year, before the deep sea well was capped, uh, and before the oil had stopped drilling, uh, stopped flowing rather, into the Gulf. Um, it goes without saying that this that this field was devastating uh, for tourism and the fishing industries along the Gulf Coast fishery and the oyster beds were closed. Uh, the fish, fishing industry continued to suffer even after fishing resumed. And as many fre uh, feared uh, that Gulf seafood was, was tainted. Uh, my question is to Mr. Daniels. Uh, you kind of indicated uh, that the uh, seafood industry is uh, that is recovering, but has it fully recovered from the oil spill? Well, that's or what's a, that's the status of it? Maybe it hasn't recovered at all. What's well, according to the FDA, um, it, it has, and there are beds where where you can fish and you can shrimp. I, I, I put more trust in the shrimp and the fish to avoid the oil than I do in, 
the government to say whether it is contaminated. <laughs> uh, uh, because shrimp and, and, and uh, not oysters, but shrimp and fish can, can avoid uh, poison areas. Uh, but I can tell you this, I eat a lot of seafood. Uh, most of us eat seafood daily, and that therein lies the problem. Uh, at, in my uh, uh, testimony that I submitted, uh, I quoted um, the uh, director of the FDA and suggesting that uh, uh, both the uh, Corexit, which is the dispersant, and the oils uh, as evaluating some of the seafood was at uh, lower levels, which I can appreciate. And so consequently, we eat it, but yet we're still ending up with these, with these uh, dead dolphins. And then I discovered that uh, the uh, federal governments, the FDA, uh, the all spill uh, response has still yet not determined the deaths of the 89 dolphin that washed up right after the spill. They've not released that information. They did say it was as a result of environment over the last year, but they've not said why. Under any other ordinary circumstances, uh, Congressman, if in fact there were a dozen eggs that showed up in Illinois and Chicago, the FDA would evaluate where those eggs came from mm -hmm. and then consequently pull in that lot mm -hmm. from that manufacturer. Well, in this case, we, we have the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. The FDA samples are very, very few. And how do you sample? How do you sample the Gulf of Mexico? How do you say that this dolphin calf was still born as a result of Corexit or whatever, mm -hmm. how do you say where it came from? So I, my, 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 the simple answer to that is that we're eating a lot of seafood there. It's very, very delicious. We'd like for you to come down and eat it. However, there's still that apprehension that should not be there. It wasn't there before April 20th. And my only suggestion to these men in the oil industry is that you have got to somehow or another say to the rest of us, your customers, that we won't put you in jeopardy. And that, that, that is basically uh, my point on that. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. And, and I, that leads me to a question for Mr. Massey. Uh, Mr. Massey, this containment, the marine containment system, now, uh, can you undeniably and categorically and definitively and absolutely say that this system would stop the floor of a subsea blowout like the one we saw last year. Is this, the, is your uh, system, this containment system, system, is this the answer that we've all been looking for? What I can say is that uh, we have the system and we have the plan that has been developed to respond to a well if an operator loses control and then subsequent containment. So we have the plan. We have the uh, equipment that, that, that's needed, and we have the resources and the people. So we've identified the plan and how we would go about capping and, and, and containing the well. So yes, I believe we do have the system, and, and we would be ready to respond if, if called upon. And, and the, government, uh, the um, Secretary Salazar has certified that this is indeed the case that this system is the appropriate one that we've been looking for, that it, it is the answer? What I, what I can tell you is Secretary Salazar and Director Bromwich did come visit us. They looked at the system uh, capacities and what we're capable of doing, and, and we've gotten the word back that it is acceptable for us to use in permit applications. And we now have permits for deep, deep water wells that are rely on our system, and uh, you know we're hopeful that those are going to be approved I uh, any day now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at this time, I recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sullivan, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this is a down the line question to Mr. Puglaresi, is that how you say your name? And uh, Mr. No, Adams, Massey, and Mason. Um, with our, and I appreciate you being here today too. Uh, with our nation approaching four to five dollar a gallon gasoline, what do you think is the main impediment to U.S. oil development, both onshore and offshore? Do you think it's the economics, or federal policies, or regulations? If you could comment on that, please. Strictly federal policy and regulation. Strictly policy. Strictly policy. One thing I didn't cover in my oral testimony was covered in my written was the history of DOCS development. 
so if you'll recall uh, we were ready to open that up just before Deepwater Horizon now that's completely off the table again uh, the Outer Continental Shelf is extremely important we need to use all our resources of course use them wisely but uh, not rule any out just because of policy thank you the administration's political desire to strangle uh, domestic exploration offshore I would agree with um, Mr. Adams as well. We, we've, we've proven as an industry, we started, as, as Americans, we invented the offshore uh, drilling business in 1938. We've drilled nearly 50,000 wells safely in the Gulf of Mexico uh, since Tr Harry Truman was in the White House. We know how to operate safely. And, and I would tell you that we have the will as an industry to produce oil and, and natural gas in the Gulf of Mexico. We have the, the, the means in which to do it safely, but we don't have the will from the administration. And we, we've seen that throughout the summer. And, and, and the questions to Mr. Massey um, uh, don't even pertain to the shallow water operations. We, we don't utilize the subsea technology, but even, even our industry has been shut down uh, uh, it, this, this summer and, and, and have proven uh, to have little traction on getting permits. So what we need is a few things, Congressman. We need a transparent regulatory process. We need the administration to issue promptly and regularly and predictably uh, dr new drilling permits. We, as a country, are the third largest oil producer in the world. Deepwater alone, is, would, if it were a separate country, would be the fourth largest oil producer in the world. We have the resources available. We have the technology available. We have the manpower available. We just need the administration to promptly execute its statutory obligations to expeditiously uh, develop the natural resources of our country. That's good. And I, I have a company in my district that is sitting out there idle right now. They have a rig and they're in with a couple other companies. And they're paying up a, like a million dollars a day and just sitting there. And they call the new organization, I forget what it's called, it used to be Mineral Management Services. It, I don't even know what the new acronym is. But um, they, they say that, uh, you know, they can't call them and they're doing everything they tell them to do, but they can't even get phone calls returned. Have you hearing some of that? I'm sure you probably have, but also my main point is, is that what if they said that this rig operator said if they can't pay them anymore, they want to get out of the contract, that's fine. They're, they already have a place to go off the coast of Africa. Um, let's say that gas prices go to $5 a gallon, which I think is possible due to this, uh, and President Obama at that point thinks, wow, maybe we need to start doing something in the Gulf. Could we get those rigs back quickly and uh, those gas prices go down quickly? Congressman, that's a great question. I, just yesterday, Transocean announced that it was entering into a 10-year contract for one of their deepwater drill ships in India. That rig will be tied up through 2020. As rigs leave the Gulf of Mexico, they typically go on long-term contracts, years, two, three years. So it'll be very difficult to get those rigs back very quickly. Uh, it, but there is, I want to emphasize a point, there is a direct relationship from uh, between the issuance of permits and gasoline prices, as I think some of the other panelists have suggested. Uh, the market is driven, it's a spot market for natural gas and crude oil, and much of that market is driven by uh, anxiety and the belief of the marketplace that the policies of our government will secure a stable supply of oil and natural gas. And I think that the, the gasoline prices today are an indictment of this administration's policies on ensuring that we're going to have a safe and predictable, secure uh, source of uh, domestic oil and gas. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Mr. Mason? Dr. Mason? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to revise your, your hypothetical a little bit. Uh, I think in a $5 a gallon scenario, it wouldn't open up drilling, but uh, the administration would more likely view this as an opportunity to further subsidize uh, electric vehicles and the batteries they contain. Uh, in my closing comments, I, I made a point. There are other externalities being developed in what we call these clean technologies. In batteries, we do not have a recycling program, a mandatory recycling program for these batteries, which contain a uh, huge amount of <coughs> heavy metals. In fact, some of the manufacturing plants in Michigan are based on one of the world's largest freshwater aquifers. Once those heavy metals leach into the aquifer, you're done. You can take it offline. You can never drink out of there again after you discover it. Too many cancers and still, uh, stillborn babies and many other things. This is not carbon pollution, but it's a very real other form of pollution that is not being priced in electric vehicles. 
I, I think it is irresponsible to leave new externalities out there just like carbon was left out there in developing these new technologies. We should price them as completely as possible while we develop them. Very good, very good. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we do have a vote on the House floor, two votes, but uh, Ms. Capps, I'm going to recognize you for five minutes for your um, question period. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, each of you, for your uh, witnesses, your testimony today. Uh, I'm going to direct my questions uh, to Dr. Cooper, uh, in part because of your title, um, Speaking Up for Consumers as uh, Research Director for the Consumer Federation of America. I want to talk, ask you to talk a little bit about the consumer benefits of making our cars and trucks more efficient. The United States imports a little more than half of the petroleum it uses. For years, we've heard from our uh, colleagues on the other side that we can drill our way to lower energy prices, and we've heard that again today. But more drilling is never going to be enough to reduce global oil prices or U.S. imports of foreign oil in any meaningful way. Uh, we use about 25 percent of the world's oil. We have only 2 percent of the world's oil reserves. So my question to you is, what would be the impact on world oil prices of increasing domestic oil production? Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, in 2007, the Energy Information Administration, under an appointee of George Bush, looked at the question of what expanding access to the OCS would do, and here's what they concluded. Access to the Pacific, Atlantic, and Eastern Gulf regions would not have a significant impact on domestic crude oil and natural gas production or prices before 2030. That's the Bush administration. At the height of the production increase created by access in the, uh, in, to the OCS, they projected an increase of domestic U.S. production of 200,000 barrels a day. Now, that may sound like a big number, but in the global war oil market, that's less than two-tenths of one percent of daily production today. And what you have heard today is the theory that an increase of two-tenths of one percent five or ten years from now is going to lower the price of gasoline today. Don't bet your farm on it. You would never make an investment on the basis of that kind of analysis. So there may be lots of other reasons to look for oil in the Gulf. But lowering the price of gasoline is not one of them. Thank you. I, I want to pick up on another theme that I've heard you say, uh, and that is um, uh, the, the key to reducing oil prices is to focus on how much oil we use. Reducing our share of global oil consumption from 25 percent could have a real impact on both oil prices and on, and on imports. Last year, the EPA and Department of Transportation issued new tail price rules for model year 2012 through 2016 on cars and trucks. The standards will reap tremendous benefits. Over the lifetime of these vehicles, this program will save 1.8 billion barrels of oil because they will be able to go farther on, uh, people will go further on a gallon of gas. And now the EIA projects the U.S. consumption of oil will stop growing, allowing us to import less oil in the future than we did in 2007. Now you represent a consumer organization, as I mentioned. Can you explain how strong fuel efficiency standards benefit consumers and also protect them from fluctuating oil prices. Madam Congresswoman, um, Mr. Pugliarisi uh, gave you a hypothetical uh, about w what might happen with $20 a barrel and what happened with Iran which in, and, and the Mideast. So let me give you another hypothetical. What happens if 15 years ago we had adopted a standard that would double our fuel economy just as we propose today to go to 60 miles per gallon. We would be consuming half as much oil, gasoline today, as we are today. Um, that would be more than 4 million barrels a day of consumption reduction. Now, that's a significant amount of oil to take off the world market. That's over 4 percent. That's the kind of reduction in consumption that gives you headroom. In fact, Four million barrels a day is equal to the total spare capacity in the world's oil industry today. So if you double spare capacity, that's the way you alleviate pressure on prices. That's why I say the most important step we can take in the short term is to make that long-term commitment, 15 years in economics is a long term, to actually reduce our consumption. We consume a quarter of the world's oil and gasoline, almost. 
if we cut our consumption in half of gasoline that has a big impact but that takes fifteen years it takes the long term and so we have to stop looking at quick fixes every time the price of gasoline jumps up because it's almost certain to jump and fall down again and start looking at that long term commitment to lowering our consumption let me see if i can get one more quick question in on tuesday this committee passed h r nine ten so-called Energy Tax Prevention Act that would actually take away EPA's authority to set stronger tailpipe standards for cars and trucks made after uh, 2016. Just answer quickly then, do you support allowing EPA to continue to work with the Department of Transportation to consider stronger tailpipe standards for cars and trucks? Well, we support the uh, interaction of a number of agencies, and it turns out that the Clean Air Act is what allow allowed 15 states be involved in this space. So in our federal system, when we have 15 states and two agencies in the federal government uh, coordinating, and that's the big development, uh, looking at the problem from different points of view, we're better off. So there is no doubt that the American consumer is better off today. We have a higher standard because of the involvement of those states in the clean cars program than we would have been otherwise, and we think that is good for uh, consumers in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm going to recognize Mr. Uh, Terry from Nebraska for five minutes, and then when he finishes, we're going to recess until 11, and we'll be back at 11 to resume uh, our questions. Mr. Right. Terry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just an observation uh, prompted by Dr. Cooper's uh, colloquy with uh, the gentlelady from California. Uh, we, we've heard some testimony here that uh, anxiety or expectations within the marketplace tend to drive commodity prices. Uh, a real life example was what we went through in 08, uh, where gas prices shot up above $4 per gallon. People were outraged. Uh, a lot of thought about speculation driving up the cost, but then when the president released the moratorium or repealed the moratorium uh, on the Florida coast in the Gulf, uh, prices dramatically started reducing. Uh, that's a real life example of once there's some certainty put back into the marketplace that there's known that there's going to be new fuel or oil uh, in the marketplace that relieved that pressure and that anxiety and brought the prices down. That's a real life example that's modern day. Uh, and so, uh, Dr. Kluglaresi, I'm sorry. Mr. Uh, Kluglaresi, close enough? I'm sorry. Dr. P. Uh, us Irish have a hard time with Italian names. I don't know why. Uh, but would you agree with that assessment that just minor tweaks where the uh, energy world sees that there's going to be additions, alleviates anxiety, and so will drive down the prices? Secondly, uh, I hear all the time that we have this 2% uh, that we control 2%, uh, but yet with the Bakken, uh, Bakken field shale up in North Dakota, we're pumping out unbelievable amount of oil from there that even 12 months ago was unexpected. Is it an accurate statement to say that since we only uh, controlled 2%, A is 2% accurate, and the fact that uh, since we only controlled 2%, it doesn't matter if we drill or not drill? Yeah. Let me give you. An you have two minutes and thirty-eight. Okay, seconds. let me give a, a counterexample. I, I think the shale gas. We should really take the lesson off of the shale gas because we, industry, Congress, administer, everyone believed we were running out of natural gas. We were going to have very high gas prices. We built on the Gulf Coast and yes, large, expensive LNG receiving facilities. Okay. They are operating at less than 10 percent capacity. We By are the way, it was Gene Green and I that had the LNG bill. Yeah, it's a good, it was a good idea, you know, but, I mean, but we are now the largest natural gas producer in the world. There is not a single geologist that came here in front of this committee years ago that said, uh, we have a lot of natural gas. And they thought we had none. So the notion that, that Dr. Cooper said that somehow we control X amount of the resources, look, we don't know till we drill it. We don't know till American ingenuity and technology has an opportunity to try different approaches. 
And if we lock up all our resources, we're never going to find out. And, and, and another point that I think is very important, look, petroleum, for a lot of reasons, has high value in the marketplace. It's relatively low to produce. It's expensive, but it's less than its value. It produces a lot of extra value, and that value is return on return on capital, it's revenues to the government, bonus bids, jobs, and most of the alternative fuels, and even some of the efficiencies, they eat money, they eat lots of money. And so we have a dilemma here. We have to decide how are we gonna go, how are we gonna move to the fuels of the future in a cost-effective way, in a way that generates a lot of economic growth. And if you foreclose this sector of the economy, which has so much value for sustaining economic growth, it's a huge mistake, and it's something we really need to sort of think through. Three seconds left, so I'm just going to give a, a, a Dr. Cooper. I have no doubt about the accuracy of your polling, but I'll give a real-life story in Lincoln, Nebraska, Lincoln Electric. This is about a little over 10 years ago. They sent out a questionnaire to their customers, said, should we add wind power? It's going to add costs. Uh, but we'd like to do it on a voluntary basis. Should we adopt this on a voluntary pay basis? 90%, I think it was like 89% of the customers uh, sent back a survey checking, yes, absolutely, we want you to have wind power and uh, it'll be paid for on a voluntary basis. They bought the wind turbines, put them up, sent out the uh, voluntary sign up, and the, uh, the take rate was about 7%. Uh, so, if you pull me, I want a, I want a 60 per mile uh, gallon car. Am I going to pay five times more for it? No. So I, I think it's all in how we ask the question in a market society. And I yield. Thank you, Mr. Terry. And uh, uh, we'll recess until at 11 o'clock and look forward to coming back and resuming question and answers. Thank you.